like to sit down, and if you are a younger, able-bodied person, and you see somebody who think I'd like to sit, please offer your seats. It is so gratifying to be together and doing it this way. And we just want to make sure that everyone that needs to sit can, and we'll begin in a moment.
Every congregation is in Tree of Life is building. I spent time and participated in the and in programs at all three of them. For a while, when I was in university, when I would come back to Pittsburgh, or Hadash was the synagogue I would attend. Tree of Life was a synagogue that I went to many times during my teenage years. And New Light Synagogue is a conservative synagogue where my wife's best friend growing up's father was the rabbi. These three congregations are close to us. Highest, the organization that the deranged individual was specifically most upset about is the organization that brought my late parents to Pittsburgh. My mother from Germany in 1938. My father was born in Poland, but from a DP camp in 1947 in Germany, after having survived the Shoah. <coughs> Hyas was the organization that helped bring my parents to North America, to the United States, to the sanctuary of Pittsburgh. Squirrel Hill is the beating heart of the Pittsburgh Jewish community. It is the neighborhood in which my wife grew up, it is a neighborhood in which my mother grew up after moving from Germany. Squirrel Hill is an incredible, wonderful, vibrant Jewish community. Every single time that we are in Pittsburgh, we spend significant amounts of time in Squirrel Hill. That is what a Jewish Jew does when they move or when they visit. When I heard the news yesterday, I, I assumed, knowing my family, that they probably would not have been in the building. But I also, of course, assumed that I would know people who were killed or be close to people who were killed. When I first turned on my phone after Shabbat, that's what we do is observant Jews as we first turn on our phone back. <laughs> I then got the information that my late parents' best friend's other best friend was among the casualties. In fact, when my parents' best friend lost their 41-year-old son a year ago, this person had traveled across the country to be there at his funeral. Today, I spoke with my sister, and I heard about her close friend, Irving Younger, who was killed. This is a story that no one else knows. And I, I don't want to get into the details of why no one else knows this, or likely why no one else will know this, except for us. My sister is probably one of the only people who knows this story, and thus we will be the only ones to know this story. Irving Younger was born in a DP camp. His parents had survived the Holocaust. His mother had had a previous family. They were all killed. His mother was one of so-called Dr. Mengele, one of Mengele's victims. When she arrived to the United States, she was told, or actually before she arrived, while she was in the DP camp, she was told that she would not ever be able to have another child. And yet Irving was born. Irving was born to a mother who was told that there was no chance of ever having another 
to have it. Dying. He died in the same parsha where a mother is told that she will have a child. Sarah was told that she will have a child despite the fact that she was nearly a hundred years old. Despite the fact that she had previously been told that she was barren. And then in the same parsha, in the same Torah portion, Abraham is asked to sacrifice that child. And Abraham goes to sacrifice that child, raises his hand, and his hand is stopped. Isaac's life is not here. And yet in this case, I only wish that the parallel had been completed. But we know that it was not. Irving, the child who never should have been born according to the doctors, was born. And on Prashat Leo, Irving was born. Yesterday, it just so happened that I was talking about a film, a documentary, that I had seen while traveling on a small holiday with my son. It's a film, a documentary about Mr. Rogers. Now, if you don't know anything about Mr. Rogers, you know, you know that he's a child uh, TV personality for children, but there's a few important pieces to know. Number one is that Mr. Rogers is a minister. Number two, that Mr. Rogers' neighborhood he died, by the way, in 2003. Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was Squirrel Hill. Mr. Rogers was in Pittsburgh. Mr. Rogers lived on Beachwood Boulevard, three minutes away from wherever this attack occurred. The church that Mr. Rogers attended was three minutes away on the other side, right across the street from the Jewish community center. When I was watching this documentary, I quickly realized that when the, when the program was given its name by a minister, by a man who was deeply religious, and his, his ongoing theme was love, that the reason the name must have come about is because of the pasuk that has the Lorecha, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Mr. Rogers taught us this pasuk, this verse, these words in a very real way. At the end of the documentary, Mr. Rogers explains, was called upon one last time to bring comfort to a nation after 9-11 just two years before he passed away. Now remember again, where it really was Mr. Rogers' neighborhood? It was Squirrel Hill. For the very first time, Fred Rogers had no idea what to say. He was stumped. He, he, he couldn't really bring the words out. It was obvious in this video. And so what did he do? He turned to the words of his neighbors. When asked, what do we tell our children? What, what do we say? Fred Rogers, in response to 9-11, Minister Rogers, in response to 9-11, said, and this is all that he said, to Kunova. This Hebrew wasn't great, so it didn't come out as well. But he had learned a lot from the response to a tragedy like this is repairing the world. A response to something like this is sadness. It is fear. It can even be anger, as one of my siblings said. She's quite angry right now that my family had moved to Pittsburgh for refuge. And this is what happened. She's 
said, thank God my parents weren't there to see this in the city to which they moved. Those are all natural responses. But in the end, as Fred Rogers borrowed from us, the response must be that we become those who prepare the world. And what I'd like to suggest is that not only today do we gather together, but that one of the things that we do, the first step, or really for us the second step of the healing process, is that this coming Shabbat, as a statement of spiritual strength, as a statement of love, as a statement of connection and devotion, that this coming Shabbat, there are no seats to be had in any of the synagogues in the city of Bangkok. That this coming Shabbat, across the lower mainland, our action is to fill the seats of all of our synagogues. May the memories of all of those filled be for a blessing. And may we wish for the Fuash a complete and quick recovery to all who are injured, either simply because they were in synagogue training or because they came running.
government of British Columbia, but I'm also here as a Jew. And I have to tell you, um, I've been pretty shaken up all weekend. Because I remember as a young person going to shul, young Israel shul in Montreal, and never having to worry about um, a locked door or having someone check my bags. It was people's place of worship that was where we gathered. And it doesn't feel like that uh, this weekend. But I want to thank my colleagues for being here, and I thank all of you for being here. And I know that we're going to heal. And I'm just so grateful to the organizers, thank you, for making a space for all of us to be here so that we can heal together. We can grieve with our families in Pittsburgh. And I can share a text that I received today from John Bergen that he asked me to read here for you today. I send my deepest sympathies to everyone gathered here today, and I share your grief. British Columbians' hearts are broken. Hearing the devastating news of the shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, everyone should feel safe in a place of worship. An attack like this is a deep violation of safety and security. My caucus and I and everyone in the House and the Legislative Assembly reject anti-Semitism, racism, discrimination, intolerance, and bigotry. When these forces rise up, we must stand united and denounce them in the strongest possible terms. We will continue to stand up for the values shared by the vast majority of British Columbians. Equality, inclusiveness, and unity. Our thoughts are with the families of those targeted and Jewish people around the world. So John Bergen, Premier of British Columbia. Pittsburgh Steelers this morning, indicating how far, how broad, how deep this has affected American society. And when a World Series game is interrupted at the beginning for a moment of silence as well. And so we are tremendously appreciative of those individuals who have come forward, representing a broad spectrum of our community. And so I would ask that these individuals who are listed, if you could please come forward and up to the table and join Selena at this time. And in addition, I also want to call on uh, Sukrat Khan, who is the president of the Pakistan Canada Association. Uh, Tarek Kyle, Abu Bakar Khan, and Fatima representing the Jamia Mosque on West Street. It was only some 18, 19 months ago that many of us stood out front of that mosque when six Muslims were slaughtered in a Quebec City mosque while they were praying. I received an email this morning from my federal member of parliament, Jody Rabel Wilson. She uh, said that she very much regrets not being here. She is stuck in Ottawa. I can understand any time you're in Ottawa, you're probably stuck. <laughs> and asked that uh, I read this uh, statement, uh, a personal statement from our Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada. Today, individuals across Canada and around the globe, persons of all faiths and backgrounds, stand in solidarity with the Jewish community, condemn the heinous attack that occurred on Shabbat, October 27, 2018, at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My husband, Tim, and I are deeply shocked and saddened by the needless loss. This afternoon, as our community comes together for memorial, led by the Rabbinical Association of Vancouver and the Jewish Federation, may we find hope and strength in expressing our shared sorrow to the Jewish community of Pittsburgh. May we also remember those who are injured and pray that they recover with speed and full completeness. 
And may we be emboldened as a community in our collective resolve to be resilient and resolute in our united stand against all forms of anti-Semitism, intolerance, and violence. There is no place for racism, hate, and prejudice in our world. In solidarity, love, and friendship, Jody wilson Rainbow, Member of Parliament for Vancouver, Randall, Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada. My colleague, Rabbi Adam Rubin, is going to now come and with our honored guests, light these memorial candles. For those, and I'm going to correct my wonderful colleague, Rabbi Infeld, these individuals were not killed. They were murdered. We must always understand the distinction. Killing is either by self-defense or accident. This was neither. They were murdered. Thank you, Rabbi Bregman. When we heard, first heard, I'm not going to give a sermon, I'm just going to give an introduction. When we first heard the news, the reaction amongst our entire community, rabbis and all, was, what are the names? Because we know in Jewish tradition we need the names. We need the names because the names connect us to the people and their story and their memory. We need the names so that we can say Kaddish. We need the names so that we can remember them for blessing. Our teacher, Dr. Chris Friedrichs at UBC, teaches us about the names of Shoah victims, of those murdered in the Holocaust, and how in some cases all we have are the names, and yet the names can be enough. Because the names tell a story of connection, the door to the door from generation to generation. The names tell us of the era they were born, of who loved them, who they were named for, who they honored in their birth, who they honored in their life. And when we got the names this morning, we, as Rabbi Infeld said, we made connections. It is a small Jewish community that feels even smaller at these moments. And then as the names trickled in, so did a little bit of the biographies and some of the pictures. We share not only their names, we share their memory, memories. May they always be for a blessing. Joyce Feinberg, 75. Retired educator. Richard Gottfried, 65. Beloved uncle, a friend of one of my teens at BBYO. Rose Malinger, 97. Survivor of the Holocaust. Jerry and Cecil, Jerry Rabinowitz. A medical doctor who was killed not in the minion but in the foyer as he rushed out hearing the gunshots to lend aid to the victims. Cecil and David Rosenthal, brothers, mentally challenged. We all know and love people like this in our synagogues and communities. They are all heart and love, as were these two brothers. Bernice and Sylvan Simon, married more than 50 years. They went to shul together every Saturday morning. Daniel Stein, a grandfather, a father of two, retired plumbing supply dealer. Melvin Wax. Always arrived early at Shul. Irving Younger, father, grandfather, was there just recovering from surgery just a week or two before. May all of their memories be for a blessing. May their names never be forgotten. Amen. I thank our elected officials and clergy and invite you to return to your seats at this time. Thank you for being here. You honor us by your presence.
different but similar to Rabbi Enfeld, I too have a close connection to the Pittsburgh Jewish community. One of my very best friends in the entire world is a rabbi in Pittsburgh at the synagogue just down the street from Tree of Life Synagogue. And Saturday morning, as I was getting into my car to drive to Shul, because that's what reform rabbis do. <laughs> my phone lit up with messages from Haaretz, from CNN, from all of the news sites, that there was breaking news. An event had happened at a synagogue in Pittsburgh on Squirrel Hill, and that's all I saw on my screen. And knowing that my friend Aaron, who is the rabbi there at Road of Shalom, that he lives in Squirrel Hill, that his synagogue is in that neighborhood, I thought it was his shul. And so I quickly texted him, and since he's also a reformed rabbi, he texted me back. <laughs> a quick message that said, we're in services, we're on lockdown, I'm okay. I reached out to Aaron later yesterday and asked if he would share with us a bit of what is going on in his community now. A message for our community here. He recorded a message and I shared it with him. Hello, I'm Rabbi Aaron Bisno. I'm a senior rabbi at Rota Shalom in Pittsburgh and I appreciate so much the chance to be with all of you in Vancouver this evening. To the miracle of our video and the recordings, I'm with you because I want to thank you for thinking of Pittsburgh and remembering us as we now have the experience of being the most recent community to be visited by not only gun violence and senseless death, but also in this time, anti-Semitism rearing its ugly head, moving from ideas and words to violence and indeed killing. Yesterday morning, as you all appreciated, we began to begin our Shabbat morning services. Word began to trickle in that a nearby congregation within our community, only a few, few blocks from here in the heart of Squirrel Hill, an active shooter was gunning his way through that, that, that building, that peaceful assembly. We're beginning to trickle out to us, and so we began our service aware that we would need in time to inform people about what was happening as news became more certain. And in fact, we did. We began our service with song and with music as we anticipated celebrating a baby naming for a young daughter born to two Jewish fathers, each of whom had adopted this young girl. We were going to celebrate that, and we had to share with our assemblage that uh, there had been an active shooting, and that we didn't have much information, but that working with local law enforcement and the state authorities, we had gone on lockdown, that the building was secure, that there was nowhere safer for us to be than to stay right where we are to continue with our service, our celebrations. And so we did that, monitoring the news and with heavy hearts, but continuing through our Shabbat celebrations and our baby meetings. And then as the shooter was apprehended, we were able to inform people that the threat had passed but that we were still going to be following the protocols that had been established for us. We were working with local law enforcement, and so we did. We truncated our service, we ended a bit early so that people could go back onto their phones and learn what they needed to learn about the situation unfolding and the casualties and the victims that had been, uh, been so sensibly hurt on the short distance from here. And then the hours subsequent to like you, we, like all of you, were following the news and learning what we could about the way in which it would impact our community. I made myself available to the media. We participated in a community-wide vigil. I think three to four thousand people attended in the heart of Squirrel Hill. And we've been spending the morning and through that, the afternoon today in various meetings with communal leadership, with our board leadership, planning how we will harden our congregational buildings and what we will do to reassure our families and how we will go about providing for the congregation.